Okay, here we go. Here we go. Hi, everyone. How are you again? <laughs> All right, good. So you can hear my voice. Um, my name is Dr. Mizani. Welcome. Uh, thank you so much for your time. It means a lot uh, that you've done this. I know you're all very exhausted, um, but it's all for a great cause, right? You're all uh, studying to uh, get into residency here in the United States. Um, um, I'm a family physician um, as a specialty uh, here in the United States. We have a residency for family medicine as well as over 100 other specialties. And so I'm a family physician in some other countries and may be known as general practice. And uh, some of you may be interested in family medicine. So hopefully we can get to uh, talk about that just a little bit. Um, and um, I'm joined over here with uh, Ms. Narissa Pollack. Uh, do you all know Ms. Pollack? Have you guys met with her yet? Yeah. Not yet. Okay. Well, it's it's probably going to be uh, very important for you guys to meet with uh, with Narissa because she's conducting one-on-one -on -one interviews uh, before today, and she's going to conduct it tomorrow. And Narissa, are you going to be there a day after uh, tomorrow as well, or tomorrow's the last day? She left. She walked out. Is she not there? She's she probably she's probably doing one-on-one -on -one interviews now. <laughs> um, but yeah, so she's probably going to be there tomorrow as well. Tomorrow is going to be the last day. The intent of the one-on-one -on -one interviews is to look at your particular situation and seeing how uh, in combination of working with Kaplan, your advisors there, and with us here at Ameri Clerkships, we can help you uh, gain a competitive edge over the rest of the applicants. But with no further ado, let's go ahead and get started with the, um, with the application. Oh, one other thing. I've been part of admission committee, so a lot of things, uh, residency admission committee, so a lot of the presentation parts that you hear is really things that uh, that uh, we learned uh, behind closed doors when we were looking at your residency applications, maybe not yours, but maybe your friends as you apply to our residency programs. Um, I was a part of Morehouse School of Medicine, Department of Family Medicine's uh, admission committee. I was part of Floyd Medical Center's uh, admission committee, and we got all sorts of uh, applications in. So hopefully we can look at it from that perspective and then be able to present to you what is it that you should be looking at uh, when you deal with clinical placement agencies, and uh, we'll define those as well. So. Um, Let's go ahead and present and share with you. There we go. Right. Everybody can uh, see the presentation now? Yeah. Okay, good. All right. Well, um, you're, you're all, um, I, it's, I think everybody is an international medical graduate uh, here, right? Just, just uh, anybody who's not graduated from medical school from outside the United States, I'd just like to know. Um, no, with a raise of hand, everybody is graduated from abroad. Yes. Everybody but one, Dr. Mazzani. Okay, but one. Okay, well, welcome. It, it's, it's quite all right. Um, it, although the, the majority of this presentation is geared towards international medical graduates, you will certainly walk away uh, with, uh, with a lot of great information, no doubt about that. Um, it's just uh, as international medical graduates, we have to do things just a little bit differently so that, uh, that uh, we have that competitive edge. But, you know, I think you're going to really enjoy it as well, our good friend back there. Uh, so the, 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 the whole point of doing clinical experiences from an international medical graduate's uh, perspective is to get into residency. Would you all agree? Yeah. yeah. Okay. All right. Well, um, you know, the good thing is that the future is absolutely bright for international medical graduates. And, and why do I say that? You may be, you may have heard a lot of things about, uh, you know, well, there is less residency positions and IMGs are not getting into residency, all of that stuff. Well, I'm here to go ahead and put all of that to rest. Um, in 2014, main match data overall, there was 540 more uh, PGY-1 positions, and PGY-1 stands for postgraduate year one uh, residency positions, primarily due to internal medicine and family medicine. Uh, and that's wonderful news, right? Nobody ever really talks about that when, when you're online and you read things. Um, and um, <clears throat> there were 40,394 registrants, but uh, there were 34,270 applicants that ranked programs. The great thing is that uh, there were 1,181 positions that were unfilled at the start of SOAP, and SOAP is the Supplemental Offer and Acceptance Program. Uh, if anybody's, is anybody in, uh, in, in the match right now, by the way? Anyone in the match? No one? Yeah, we do have one. Oh, one person. Okay. All right. Yeah. So, so you're probably kind of thinking about whether you're going to have to go through SOAP or you're going to match. And so the good news is just, you know, God forbid if you don't match, if you find out by March 16 that you didn't match, there's going to be somewhere around 1,000 to 1,200 positions that are going to be unfilled 
uh, during the supplemental offer and acceptance program, which then you will have to you will have access to if you're unmatched. That's about five percent of the programs that remain unmatched, so that's important. Um, now, the match rate for U.S. international medical graduates, those that don't need a visa sponsorship, was about fifty-three percent, which is the highest in two thousand and five, right? And then for non-U.S. IMGs. 49.5%, which is, again, highest in the past 10 years. Um, so, again, those are the reasons why I say the future is uh, is absolutely bright for international medical graduates. Um, now, for our one good friend that is going through SOAP, why should you – well, we don't know if you're going to go through SOAP, but uh, if anybody hasn't had five interviews in the same specialty, you probably have to consider going through SOAP. Um, and uh, um, in, in 2014, there were 486 fewer position uh, applicants, individuals that were SOAP eligible. There were 13,276, so about almost 500 less. So that means better uh, odds for, for those that are going through SOAP, at least for 2014. Um, and what happened is that the, in the bowl down here are the, the final results. So there were... 3,724 U.S. international medical graduates, 95 of whom got positions that way. Now, you may think, well, that's not that much, but the thing is this was like the last chance. These people thought that there's no way I'm getting in. Uh, there is no, no, no chance for me. But almost 100 U.S. Medical, international medical graduates got in, and 81 non-U.S. international medical graduates got in. So all of those good doctors that are here today um, that uh, that have had their visa sponsored uh, or are here on, on, on B1, B2 visas. Those are all non-US IMGs and 81 got in. So that's 176 international medical graduates that got in during SOAP. So again, the future is bright and it's very important that you all stay very hopeful all the way to the end. It is absolutely possible and it's uh, uh, and it's uh, very very doable. I'm gonna get I'm gonna get this particular slide out of the way really quick because a lot of people are gonna wonder. Well, how much does clinical placement cost? Well, it varies, but considering the benefits and the outcome, it is relatively inexpensive. It works out to be about nine dollars an hour, right? Uh, that's what the cost of clinicals are. So that's about four hundred and seventy nine to you know, $579 a week for teaching hospital guarantee. It may be fully or partially paid for by your sponsors, and it may be supplemented with a variety of other services. So now that we got the cost out of the way, um, you know, and, and for a lot of you that are there, especially the complete prep doctors, those, you know, you get eight weeks of clinicals included in your, in your um, uh, membership there with, uh, with Kaplan. Uh, so they'll pay for that. But, you know, clinical placement alone may be misleading if your goal is just to get into residency. Again, what do I, what do I really mean by that? Um, so let's say that you're you're conducting uh, just clinical experience and and you're hoping that okay so I'm going to do clinicals I graduated from medical school and uh, and and I'm going to go ahead and apply to residency and that's it that's all I should really need and that's that's where the misleading part comes in you know a few years back uh, probably about ten years back uh, we used to just um, you know we had we had a great group of people and they would do five months six months of clinical experience and they still wouldn't get into residency and I started wondering why is that I mean they're doing great clinicals and I found out that it's all the other aspect of the residency application that is getting them into trouble for example they're using incorrect language the grammar is incorrect the letters of recommendation are not really recommending them or there is you know th there may be referring him by to him by a different name there may be misspellings and so what happens is when your application comes to us in the admission committees uh, or it's if it's going through a clinical pl a placement agency's hands what they need to do is they need to really look at your application from an admission committee's perspective and really see in the first 30 seconds as soon as the application comes in do they see do we see any red flags right so because before we get out to, into all of your research before we get into all your clinical experiences before we get into you know what reputable medical school you graduated from we're going to just look at that application and we're going to see okay does all of this really make sense can i find anything wrong with it in the first 30 seconds and if i can i'm going to gauge it if it's big enough of a problem i'm probably not going to go ahead and look at the rest of it or even look at the letters of recommendation and we found out there was a lot of that going on so that's why it's so important then when you're just looking to get into residency you absolutely have to go ahead and and get additional assistance with making sure the application is put together very strongly the personal statement is done by somebody who has a lot of experience in working with international medical graduates as well as admission committees so that when they're putting it together it's not so perfect 
that is just absolutely perfect English and if it doesn't match the way you speak, right? Because if I'm looking at a personal statement and I'm saying, wow, this is fantastic. Let me go ahead and invite you for an interview. And then I'm trying to speak with you and I see that every third word you have to pause uh, or every, you know, or I can't even hold a complete uh, 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 conversation with you uh, without there being a lot of, mm, uh, 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 it just doesn't match the personal statement. So, so we got to make sure that the personal statement is not so perfect. It's got to match your personality. So those are all the things that make a difference. But so what happens, you know, so some of us may say, well, you know, it's not that big of a deal. Let's say that I go, uh, I go through this and, and uh, I, you know, if I don't secure residency, it's not a big deal. I'm going to try again. You know, I have, um, uh, I have, uh, I have family that is supporting me. I have government that is supporting me. Well, it's so much more than just doing clinicals than just going to the match again. Uh, you know, the, the support service that you receive uh, from a clinical uh, placement agency uh, for a lack of a better term, right, because there's so much more to it than just clinical placement. But the support that you receive has got to be so that it focuses on you getting into residency because if you don't, uh, what happens? You could lose your sponsorship, of course. It could be from the government or it could be from your medical school or whoever your sponsor is. You could be a match reapplicant. That's a new category that uh, ERAS is using. And, uh, you know, I don't know if, it, if, if the programs are actually seeing that, but they, you get marked as a match reapplicant if, uh, you know, so that you can reuse a lot of your documentation. Um, and then um, you would have to redo everything on your residency application again if you have to go through the match again, right? And what do I mean by that? That means your letters of recommendation now, it's, which is going to be two years old, it's not going to be good for 2017, right? If you if you got your clinical experience this year, um, you know, if it's anything more than 12 months, then the letter of recommendation starts to lose its uh, value. Uh, you have to redo your personal statement. You have to redo your ERAS application. You have to redo a lot of things. Um, and then, so every year that goes by too, you, you, the chances of you matching uh, also decreases. Uh, and those are these are all just published data by NRMP. Um, you, the, your own morale and confidence can decrease. Um, your competition could be increasing. There could be changes in policy in in how IMGs get into residency. There's a seven year limit for passing all the US MLEs uh, for uh, a lot of the states. And then there's some financial costs as well, right? Which which we usually don't really think about. But the cost of really not securing residency for those of us that are going to be practicing here in the United States is, is anywhere between $130,000 to $420,000 annually, right? That's just purely looking at what the salary of, of a physician is, and it varies by specialty. But it's, a, it's an important number to keep in mind. So how do you get into residency? You've got to have short-term goals, and you got to have long-term goals, right? Um, whenever you sit down, you're like, oh, you know, I'm, I, this is overwhelming. There's so much i got to do. Uh, don't get overwhelmed at all by any means because over a million doctors have already done it and they're practicing right now in the United States. We've all done it, right? We've all done it. So the first thing you got to do is you got to make sure you do not feel overwhelmed. It is very doable and actually what's going to keep you going is as you're doing, as you're studying for your USMLEs and then you start thinking, okay, theoretically I'm good, right? I'm, I'm scoring good on the practice exams. I've done, I've done a shelf exam. I'm doing really good on those exams. It's good indications that I'm going to do well in the USMLEs. Now I'm going to go ahead and do some clinical so that I get used and familiar to U.S. healthcare system. That's making me feel better. It's making me feel like I can actually compete better. Why? Because at the end of the day, everything that you do right now, you have to think about it from an interviewer's perspective, right? All that, that you're doing right now, you're doing this to get your residency interviews, okay? So if you're in an interview with me and I say, well, tell me about your U.S. clinical experiences, how wonderful is it for you to be able to go ahead and just describe it, tie that right into how you studied for your U.S. MLEs, tie it into what you did from the country that you come from, and why you would make such a fantastic addition to this residency program, all because you tied it all in into one nice package and were able to present it to me. So the more you look at yourself and your candidacy in that fashion, the more you're going to get the energy to keep going and be able to go ahead and do everything multitask, because at the end of the day, that's what a physician does. Us, right we multitask and we're very very good at it that's what makes a really good physician when you get those 10 admissions back to back to back to back and then after you're done with all the admissions and your call night you go back to the clinic and got to see some of your patients again that's what makes us so so powerful within the healthcare industry and makes us feel good it's a very empowering feeling right so start doing that now training your mind training your body spiritually just whatever you need to do just get ready to multitask and that's what these um, these these slides are supposed to do for you. So, 
you set short term and you set long term goals, right? So that you don't overwhelm yourself. Short term, you got to pass the USMLEs, no doubt about it, right? If you're still a medical student, you got to finish your clerkships. I say, I think most of us are graduates here in the room. Uh, just in case you haven't finished medical school, you still have to do clerkships. Um, and then you want to graduate if you haven't graduated yet. And so most of us may have done number two and number three, may not have done number one. You want to, you may want to get travel. You want to get that out of the way within the first one to 12 months. If you have any family obligations, you want to get those out of the way. Finances, you want to get those out of the way. There may be other issues that you're dealing with. But once you get into 13 to 36 months, which would be your long-term goal for most of us, again, for the one uh, individual, for one doctor that is in the match right now, um, hopefully all of these have been completed. And uh, this is all that you're, you, and you've completed some of the, the right column as well. But, you know, again, you can, you can be the judge of that. So long-term, 13 to 36 months, objectives would be you want to make sure that you become eligible for ERAS and your timeline. You want to fill your gaps since you graduated from medical school because that's one of the, the most important criteria when you ask the program directors, why would you give somebody uh, an interview? And they say, well, I'm going to look at their gaps in their medical education since they graduated, and it's got to make sense. Um, and then um, you want to look at your competitiveness. You want to look at the specialties competitiveness. You want to look at the programs competitiveness, right? So there's three there's three circles running at the same time, and they're kind of converging with one another. And then you want to think about your ERAS supporting documents, uh, which is your personal statement. If you're applying to California, your postgraduate training authorization letter. If you are uh, if you are applying to anywhere else, you need to think about having four. U.S. letters of recommendation and at least, you know, most of the programs are going to ask for between two months and 12 months of U.S. clinical experience, right? So you want to start thinking, how do I start putting that together? And then there's other things that you got to keep in mind as well. Um, so mm -hmm. some of the important dates that you want to remember, and this repeats itself pretty much every year, is September to January. That's when the interviews happen. Uh, and then January 15th, your, you start to rank the programs that you interviewed at, and then February, you want to rank, you want, that's it, you have to certify your rank order list in March, middle of March, you're going to find out if you match, and then March 16th to 19th for this year is when SOAP starts, right, you get to apply to 45 programs, you get to apply to them in batches, uh, the program sends you an offer if they like what they see, and then if they don't, you go through the next round, the next round, the next round. And then hopefully you you get an offer and hopefully you'll accept it. And then uh, this year, March 20th is um, uh, March 20th, and the May 31st ERAS closes, and then July 1st is the start of your 2016 match. Why am I going through these things with you? Because you say, well, I thought that the uh, the title of this presentation was what to expect from clinical placement agencies. Exactly. The job of ours does not end once we secure a clinical site for you. You want to be able to go to your med advisors at Kaplan. You want to be able to come to your advisors here at American Clerkships and be able to freely discuss your situation so we can help put a consistent residency application together for you and to be able to present you to residency programs, right? So a clinical placement, their job should hopefully never end after they put you in a clinical site. They got to stay by you. They got to have experience from admission committee's perspective. Hopefully, like myself, they're a physician. They've been, they've looked at applications, thousands of them, right? Real applications, not just applicants that are about to be sent to admission committees. The they're on the receiving end. They got to be able to see the whole thing and how the entire residency reacts to that, right? They got to be able to tell you whether courtesy interviews, right? Anybody heard of courtesy interviews, by the way? Anybody know what a courtesy interview is? No, they don't know, Dr. Mathani. Okay, so have you have you ever heard of, of a friend maybe that, that has received an interview because they knew somebody in, 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 in a particular residency? Yes. Yeah, I have. I got three of them, right, because I knew people. And what happened is I would meet with this one person that gave me the interview, and then I would meet with the other people, and they would just grill me. They would just destroy me. Why? Because they weren't a part of giving you this interview. And they just had these questions that I didn't have answers for. And it was very uncomfortable because I knew I was there because somebody did somebody a favor and got me an interview. We call those courtesy interviews, right, because they're doing that courtesy to be courteous and then I got there and I'm like okay well this is just this is gruesome I mean this is and some of them are not really even real interviews I would just meet with the program director for 15 20 minutes he or she would ask me a few questions lead me to believe that they're gonna rank me 
and I would rank them. And I even received an email once, and the email said, you know, we were so impressed with your interview, and we're going to rank you very, very highly. And I said, wow, I was not going to rank you guys as number one, but now that I got this email, I'm going to rank you as number one. I was thinking that to myself. I did. Guess what? I didn't get placed. I found out later because I became a part of the admission committee of the same medical school, different specialty, I found out later that email was sent to every single person that interviewed there. How horrible do you think that the candidate feels? And so I can't imagine, and a lot of programs do that, unfortunately, right? A lot of them do that. So you got to watch, it's, you, it's really you against, you know, the the, the the interviewers or the or the programs that are interviewing that so you just got to be very smart how you do this and you got to be able to get the right type of assistance so that we can all together get your application to really be competitive so I'm going to go back to the slides again and if you have any questions please uh, just go ahead and hold them and we're going to go ahead and ask them in in a, in a few minutes and and um, and uh, yeah so we're at 10:32 we started a little bit late um, and we're going to go ahead and ask them in about five minutes uh, Marissa it, by the way quick pause is the food there yet <laughs> Narissa? Sheila. Sheila. Okay, guys, sorry. Has the food arrived, guys? Nope. No. Not yet. Not yet. Okay. I can smell it. You can smell it. <laughs> okay. Well, let me know once the food arrives, please, so that we can take a quick pause and then uh, have you guys eat because I know your days are really busy. So September to January is what you guys are focusing on. This is what you guys care about, right? So you want to see how many of you want to go ahead and see your internal medicine residencies? Can I see with a raise of hand, please? Internal medicine? Wow, okay, so about a third of the room. Third of the room, okay, all right. So have you ever wondered what does it take to go ahead and get an internal medicine interview? Our friends? Well, here is the top 10 factors by percentage, and the right column are the top 10 factors by importance. So NRMP, ask program directors, Mr. Internal Medicine, Mrs. Internal Medicine Program Director, what do you care about when you see an applicant and when you want to give them an interview? What are the most what is the what is the most important factor to you and what factors were ranked uh, the most often by these guys? So by percentage, these are the top 10 that came up most frequently. Step 1 score, your dean's letter, step 2 score, US versus international medical graduate. CS, whether you passed it or not, the absent medical education, letters of recommendation from internal medicine, your core clinical grades, right? So clinical experience, this is where it com comes in. Honors in clinicals, whether you got an honor in all the clinicals that you did. And then if there's evidence of professionalism and ethics, the left column is a little misleading because that is just by how often it came up. And the right column is what the importance is, was ranked by importance. And the number one was if you were ever flagged for match violation. Anybody can tell me what this means? What does it mean to be flagged for match violation? Anyone? No. no? Can you uh, can you give me an example of that, please? Uh, to keep us in contact with the program. Uh, I'm trying to uh, change the program ladder, actually. Very good. Excellent. Yes. So, so, so whether you want to change the mind of the residency program uh, and tell them, I'm, I'm going to rank you as number one, or if the program comes and says, uh, Can we move the microphone if possible? Yeah, we can hear you. Hold on, Dr. Mazami. Okay. It's fixed, right? Okay, yeah. yeah. Okay, very okay, good. Sir. So we're setting up the food right now. Okay, wonderful. Thank you. So yeah, so if you try to change and tell them you're ranking them as number one, or if they tell you you're 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 being ranked as number one, that'll be a violation. But it's not a violation if they say we're going to rank you highly, which is what they did uh, to me and they do to a lot of people. Um, so uh, yeah, that's one. Or if you call programs um, outside of the. Oh yay! Um, uh, yeah. We're, yeah, we're back. Uh, or if you okay. call, yeah, if you call the programs uh, outside of the match, um, and uh, yeah, that's that's the uh, that's the other problem. So, uh, evidence of professionalism and ethics. Your dean's letter was the third most important. Step two, CS for internal medicine was uh, was the. 
uh, was the fourth most important. CK score was the fifth most important. Desired specialty clinical grade. So your grades. So after you do your clinicals with a Mary Clerkship, for example, there is an evaluation. You get a grade as a result of it. You can upload that with your letter of recommendation as one document. And so that could fulfill number six uh, criteria here. Step one score number seven. Gaps in your medical education came very close as number eight. Core clinical grades, which means how did you perform in internal medicine, family medicine, pediatric psychiatry, general surgery, and uh, uh, and family and uh, OBGYN, those six. How did you perform in all of those? And then desired specialty honors. Did you honor internal medicine as a result of all of that? Um, uh, so you know, uh, and then so let's go to the next specialty. Anybody interested in family medicine? One person, two people, three, four, five. Okay, so we got five. So that's a that's a good number. Let's go back over here, and uh, and so what you see in family medicine is I'm just going to go by importance again. Number one, flag for match violation. Number two, evidence of professionalism. Number three. Perceived commitment to family medicine. Number four, gaps in your medical education. Five, visa status. Six, step two, CS passing. Seven, prior knowledge of you uh, by the program. Eight, perceived interest in family in the program. Nine, CK score. Ten, was U.S. versus international medical graduate. So, and then finally, anybody interested in general surgery? Yeah. Yeah, okay. we have a lot interested in general okay. surgery. All right, great. Well, here's but your general can, surgery. Can we? They're asking if they can grab some food yes, and absolutely. sit down and continue speaking with yep. you. Sounds good. You guys okay. go ahead and uh, grab the food. Yes, please. And uh, and so and maybe I'm just gonna the lights are over here. Yeah, we'll and just then, pause for a little bit and then we'll get started again. The line. Okay, so oh, hi, yeah, over there. So the making three stations only. Thank you, King. These have.
Narissa, hi. Can you um can you go ahead and un I muted you guys. Can you go ahead and unmute yourself, please? Okay, everyone. Yep. Good. So we just have a, we have about ten more students that are getting their pizza and sitting down. Okay. All right, everyone. So um, let me go ahead and answer some questions for you guys because I think you know you, you may have a lot of questions right now. Um, if if not, I can just go ahead and finish the presentation up. Uh, but uh, if you have any questions, please raise your hand and you can go ahead and ask it. And Narissa is going to go ahead and, um, and and voice it. Uh, any questions? You know, Dr. Vasani, can you? Um because we have such a large quantity of students that are looking for general surgery, can we kind of talk about general surgery? Would you guys mind if we discussed general surgery? Or did you have any specific questions for him that you would like him to answer in regards to clinical placement? General? Okay, yes, general surgery. Okay. Uh, they're asking if you can discuss general surgery, and then we can go into some questions. Sure, sure, yeah, that sounds fine. Uh, okay, so let's go ahead and talk about general surgery. Uh, general surgery uh, versus other specialties, um, they seem to care uh, a lot about, um, about whether your, uh, you know, how your basic sciences are, uh, and that's why step one score was so important to them. Uh, and then um, whether you're really serious about general surgery, and that's why they require uh, to see if you received any honors in your general surgery as a clinical experience. So look at that. Step one score was the third most important. Two was evidence of professionalism. Again, it seems like when we go and when we compare uh, surgery with... Uh, with family medicine and with internal medicine, the first two are all evidence of uh, professionalism, in fact, for match violation. Number three is where your basic sciences uh, knowledge comes in. And then to impress general surgeons would be whether you received an honor in your clinicals in general surgery. Number five was also, again, another indication of how serious you are and how other surgeons feel about you here in the United States. And that's why. Um, it even ranked a little bit more important than CK score with regards to general surgeons, letters of recommendation from surgeons, uh, so as number five. Then they got into more theoretical plus clinical, which is your step two CK score. And then seven most important to them was whether you're a U.S. medical graduate versus international medical graduate. Don't let that discourage um, anybody who's an international medical graduate at all uh, because there's a very large percentage of, uh, of uh, general surgery uh, residents who are international medical graduates so it is not an impossible specialty to get. 
Uh, and then perceived commitment to specialty. Again, look how many times the reference is being made by these program directors that look, if you're going to apply to general surgery, you better show me that you're committed to general surgery. And it's not as easy as just saying, well, you know, I've always wanted to be a general surgeon or, um, you know, I've, I've been a surgeon in my country for so many years, so that should show commitment. They want to see if you're committed to being a general surgeon here in the United States. Uh, so uh, the, to the untrained eye, uh, you, uh, your application may look completely um, uh, familiar to general surgery in the U.S., but when we look at it, we're going to look to see if there, you have letters of recommendation from surgeons here in the United States, at least a couple of general surgery letters of recommendation from the United States, and other uh, uh, two letters of recommendation from related specialties, maybe in internal medicine. There's a lot of medicine in general surgery, and then possibly maybe from one of the subspecialties of medicine, um, you know, uh, plastic surgery or, or any other subspecialty of, uh, of medicine. Uh, so, so those are all uh, really important. And then, what even makes it more important in these letters? How do I know you're committed to general surgery? Is if you're, if in the letter it says that you guys even talked about general surgery and you're only applying to general surgery. Again, that shows commitment to uh, to general surgery. I'm trying to paint a picture for you guys of how your application gets looked at when when we see it. And then leadership qualities, and then desired specialty clinical grades. Right. So even if you didn't get honors, number 10, how did you do in your general surgery? Right. Uh, did you what, did you get a C? Did you get a D or did you get an A? Uh, if you didn't get an honor, did you get a high honor? So that desired specialty, your clinical experience in general surgery comes up again. And then leadership qualities. Um, anybody have any idea of how to show leadership qualities in an application? No, I can't hear you. Repeat again, please. Volunteering? Um, not really. Volunteering is important. There's a direct correlation between match rate and, and direct um, volunteer experience, which for graduates you would be doing a high-level volunteer uh, work. Uh, there's a direct correlation between match rate and volunteerism, but no, that doesn't really show leadership. Leadership would be if you're part of organizations, let's say you're going for general surgery, um, you become a uh, part of a general surgery society here in the United States, and you start organizing events or taking part in um, in a lot of the work that they do, going to uh, to symposiums, annual symposiums, being members of the different committees, um, and then taking leadership roles that way, making changes in the community, documented changes in the community, where you will ultimately be doing residency and practicing medicine. And so, again, the the concept of volunteerism is somewhat unique. Um, to the, the, the Western world. Uh, there is a lot of volunteerism that occurs in other countries as well, but over here there's just such a tremendous emphasis on volunteerism. So yes, it's important for you to do it, but the leadership quality is a complete different category. Um, so does that answer your question with regards to, um, does that answer your question with regards to uh, general surgery? Yeah. Okay. All right, great. Hopefully that was uh, that was helpful to all. And then you do the same thing for other specialties too, but you just have to treat it as if you're applying to just that specialty, right? Um, so uh, yeah, we took our food break, and then so your U.S. clinical experience and letters of recommendation incredibly important. Um, you know, we um, um, so you know some of the common questions that you may have is, do you need U.S. clinical experience? Um, uh, you know. I hope by now you would all answer yes, right? Does anybody not think that you need U.S. clinical experience? Okay, all right, good. So um, another uh, another question that uh, you would be asked is, should I set up my clinicals on my own? Uh, won't the physician's malpractice cover me? Uh, will you guarantee my experience, and how much will the uh, will this whole thing cost me? So. We kind of answered the, the last question first. I just wanted to get that off of everybody's mind. Uh, and now that you know what the cost of not getting into residency or having a complete application is, I think uh, you look at you know just much more than just clinical uh, placement, but just looking at your entire application altogether. Um, you know, uh, uh, as far as uh, uh, should I set up my own clinicals on my own, I, I absolutely would never recommend it. Your medical school would not recommend you setting up clinicals on your own unless it is done under contract and there's goals and expectations set. Um, so, so you shouldn't really do that on your own either. And that's what we do. We 
we're the ones that negotiate everything with the clinical sites, make sure that you're protected. You don't do things that you're not supposed to. You don't overstep the boundaries. You don't underdo uh, what you can do legally. And uh, so those are all very complicated. You shouldn't have to worry about any of these things. You should just be able to learn what you're supposed to do, go in, set it up. And if there's any administrative issues, if a physician uh, changes their mind and or if the clinical site stops serving international medical graduates, then you need to make sure you can rely on that, uh, on that organization to be able to find your replacements very, very quickly because time is of essence here. So I, I absolutely don't recommend that you set up clinicals on your own as much as I don't recommend people studying USMLE on their own. Um, it's a it's a whole different animal. It's a whole different beast, and uh, and there's a lot of uh, of complexities to it. Um, and then finally, if somebody sets up clinicals on their own, most likely it's not insured. So there's legal ramifications of it, right? Um, you could uh, if there's a malpractice lawsuit, everybody gets called in, and you don't have the insurance that is just for graduates or for your level of uh, of expertise. Then then uh, you could personally be responsible for for the outcome of a of a of a lawsuit as well. So. Or paying for an attorney, etc. Again, not saying these to scare you. I'm just saying if you ever wondered about setting up clinicals on your own, or if you go online and people say, "Well, go ahead and set it up on your own," well, the physician isn't going to respect uh, as much as if there is a, a a third party that is also supervising you and watching to make sure that you're doing things uh, right, or making sure the physician is doing things right, uh, supervising administratively. Um, and then, uh, when the physician's malpractice cover uh, me, no, absolutely not, because you're not going to be practicing medicine. Therefore, their malpractice is not going to cover you. So we have a very specific malpractice. Uh, uh, sorry, there is a very specific professional liability insurance that covers all of our members, and that's what you're going to be covered as. And then, will you guarantee my experience? There are certain things in a clinical experience we guarantee. There are certain things that is not guarantiable. Uh, for example, if you don't have transportation and you go to the clinical site and the physician has an admission at 10 p.m. and you're unable to get to it or if the weather is bad and it takes you two hours to get to the hospital and already the patient has been discharged um, you know then your experience does uh, 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 you know it, it, it gets less and less so the more obstacles that somebody has to face then the, 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 the more impact that could have on the overall experience but yes, if we say that you're going to be going to a teaching hospital, you will go to it. If you don't, we need to know about it immediately so we can fix the situation. Um, and everything is categorized based on you know what the features of a clinical site is. Is it outpatient, inpatient, all inpatient, majority inpatient, not as much inpatient? You know, all of them is categorized. And Ms. Nurse and Pollock is going to discuss all of that with you in your one-on-ones. And then the cost we uh, we certainly discussed. Okay, um, let's go ahead and uh, discuss this real quick. We. So there are different types of clinicals, right? There's externships, there's shadowing, there's clinical experience, there's clinical clerkships. Um, clinical clerkships are uh, are for medical students. Uh, clinical experiences are for medical graduates. Externships are not for medical graduates. That's a wrong term to use. Externships are for vocational healthcare students that are getting credit for what they're doing, and it is and it is a part of healthcare, not medicine. Uh, for example, medical assisting is externships. Registered nurses do externships. Emergency medical technicians do externships. Medical doctors do not do externships, so that's a wrong term to use. And then there's shadowing, and usually you see those. Um, you know, by entities that don't want to insure you, that don't want you to be involved in any shape or form, um, and they just want you to shadow. So you get that from some of the big name hospitals. They have a shadowing program, but it's it's really useless uh, because that doesn't look good on your application um, uh, at all because you didn't really get to do anything. You didn't even get to speak with anybody. Um, general advice about who do you work with when you're working with clinical placement uh, agencies uh, who's organizing these clinical placements is it somebody who's gone through medical school is it somebody who's gone to medical school but was unable to get into residency and they decided to start a business um, you know what is uh, or is it actually somebody like like us who's gone to medical school residency admission committees and is doing this because we're very familiar with the entire process so to us uh, it's it, you know the way that we do it is is much more tedious uh, but but it's the way that it should be done if we really want to truly help you and then what is the relationship uh, between the agencies and the uh, and the clinical site and and every one of our American clerkships clinical sites we're under contract with the attending physicians so there's goals and expectations that uh, that you're also protected by and then patient safety and patients rights uh, 
it, we, we put you through uh, HIPAA uh, orientation. There is uh, patient privacy uh, tests that you have to do. There's orientation generally for clinicals. Um, and then, uh, so to us, that's very, very important. So you, we don't want you to just walk into a clinical site and, uh, and expect to be functioning just like you were in, in another country where you're licensed in. In the United States, you have to take a couple of steps backwards and then so that you can take a few steps forwards. So, but we'll teach you all. Yes. Dr. Mazzani, um, their class is, is ready to begin. Okay. All right. So we've got to end the presentation. All right. So the last, um, if you want to get your clinicals, make sure that you go to CAPSites, CAPSites.com, and your advisor over there can help you find the clinical sites. Um, and then finally, finally, one-on-ones with Ms. Narissa Pollock. Um, go to americlerkships.org events March 2. She will cover a lot of the things that we did not cover with you. Uh, but as you can see, there's a lot that uh, that can be covered, uh, and, and unfortunately, time is not uh, enough. Is there any questions I can answer for you in the last minute or two? Anything? No, it doesn't look like we have any questions. Okay, okay. I'm sure something will come up. Uh, please uh, attend the one-on-ones with Nurse Pollock. Thank you very much for your time. Hopefully, the food hit uh, hit the spot, and uh, all the best with your US Emily preparations. Uh, good Thank luck, you, everyone. Dr. Thank you very much. Thank you. Hi. Uh, well, we offer them everywhere. We offer 59 different specialties all across the nation. So, um, based on the North Carolina.